Section 9 of State of the Union Addresses, 1790 through 1816. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. State of the Union Address, John Adams, November 22, 1797. Gentlemen of the Senate and Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, I was for some time apprehensive that it would be necessary on account of the contagious sickness which afflicted the city of Philadelphia to convene the national legislature at some other place. This measure it was desirable to avoid, because it would occasion much public inconvenience and a considerable public expense, and add to the calamities of the inhabitants of the city, whose sufferings must have excited the sympathy of all their fellow citizens. Therefore, after taking measures to ascertain the state and decline of the sickness, I postponed my determination, having hopes now happily realized, that without hazard to the lives or health of the members, Congress might assemble at this place, where it was next by law to meet. I submit, however, to your consideration whether a power to postpone the meeting of Congress, without passing the time fixed by the Constitution, upon such occasions, would not be a useful amendment to the law of 1794. Although I cannot yet congratulate you on the re-establishment of peace in Europe and the restoration of security to the persons and properties of our citizens from injustice and violence at sea, we have nevertheless abundant cause of gratitude to the source of benevolence and influence for the interior tranquillity and personal security for propitious seasons, prosperous agriculture, productive fisheries, and general improvements, and above all, for a rational spirit of civil and religious liberty, and a calm but steady determination to support our sovereignty, as well as our moral and our religious principles, against all open and secret attacks. Our envoys extraordinary to the French Republic embarked, one in July, the other in August, to join their colleague in Holland. I have received intelligence on the arrival of both of them in Holland, from whence they all proceeded on their journeys to Paris within a few days of the 19th of September. Whatever may be the result of this mission, I trust that nothing will have been omitted on my part to conduct the negotiation to a successful conclusion, on such equitable terms as may be compatible with the safety, honor, and interest of the United States. Nothing in the meantime will contribute so much to the preservation of peace and the attainment of justice as manifestation of that energy and unanimity of which, on many former occasions, the people of the United States have given such memorable proofs, and the exertion of those resources for national defense, which a beneficent providence has kindly placed within their power. It may be confidently asserted that nothing has occurred since the adjournment of Congress, which renders inexpedient those precautionary measures recommended by me to the consideration of the two houses at the opening of your late extraordinary session. If that system was then prudent, it is more so now, as increasing depredations strengthen the reasons for its adoption. Indeed, whatever may be the issue of the negotiation with France, and whether the war in Europe is or is not to continue, I hold it most certain that permanent tranquility and order will not soon be obtained. The state of society has so long been disturbed, the sense of moral and religious obligations so much weakened, public faith and national honor have been so impaired, respect to treaties has been so diminished, and the law of nations has lost so much of its force, while pride, ambition, avarice, and violence have been so long unrestrained, there remains no reasonable ground on which to raise an expectation that a commerce without a protection or defense will not be plundered. The commerce of the United States is essential, if not to their existence, at least to their comfort, their growth, prosperity, and happiness. The genius, character, and habits of the people are highly commercial. Their cities have been formed and exist upon commerce. Our agriculture, fisheries, 
arts, and manufactures are connected with and depend upon it. In short, commerce has made this country what it is, and it cannot be destroyed or neglected without involving the people in poverty and distress. Great numbers are directly and solely supported by navigation. The faith of society is pledged for the preservation of the rights of commercial and seafaring no less than of other citizens. Under this view of our affairs, I should hold myself guilty of a neglect of duty if I forbore to recommend that we should make every exertion to protect our commerce and to place our country in a suitable posture of defense as the only sure means of preserving both. I have entertained an expectation that it would have been in my power at the opening of the session to have communicated to you the agreeable information of the due execution of our treaty with His Catholic Majesty respecting the withdrawing of his troops from our territory and the demarcation of the line of limits, but by the latest authentic intelligence, Spanish garrisons were still continued within our country, and the running of the boundary line has not been commenced. These circumstances are the more to be regretted as they cannot fail to affect the Indians in a manner injurious to the United States. Still, however, indulging the hope that the answers which have been given will remove the objections offered by the Spanish officers to the immediate execution of the treaty. I have judged it proper that we should continue in readiness to receive the posts and to run the line of limits. Further information on this subject will be communicated in the course of this session. In connection with this unpleasant state of things on our western frontier, it is proper for me to mention the attempts of foreign agents to alienate the affections of the Indian nations and to excite them to actual hostilities against the United States. Great activity has been exerted by those persons who have insinuated themselves among the Indian tribes residing within the territory of the United States to influence them to transfer their affections and force to a foreign nation, to form them into a confederacy and prepare them for war against the United States. Although measures have been taken to counteract these infractions of our rights to prevent Indian hostilities and to preserve entire their attachment to the United States, it is my duty to observe that to give a better effect to these measures and to obviate the consequences of a repetition of such practices, a law providing adequate punishment for such offenses may be necessary. The commissioners appointed under the fifth article of the Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation between the United States and Great Britain to ascertain the river which was truly intended under the name of the River St. Croix mentioned in the Treaty of Peace met at Passamaquoddy Bay in 1796 October and viewed the mouths of the rivers in question and the adjacent shores and islands, and being of opinion that actual surveys of both rivers to their sources were necessary, gave to the agents of the two nations instructions for that purpose, and adjourned to meet in Boston in August. They met, but the surveys requiring more time than had been supposed, and not being then completed, the commissioners again adjourned to meet at Providence in the state of Rhode Island in June next when we may expect a final examination and decision. The commissioners appointed in pursuance of the sixth article of the treaty met at Philadelphia in May last to examine the claims of British subjects for debts contracted before the peace, and still remaining due to them from citizens or inhabitants of the United States. Various causes have hitherto prevented any determinations, but the business is now resumed and doubtless will be prosecuted without interruption. Several decisions on the claims of citizens of the United States for losses and damages sustained by reason of irregular and illegal captures or condemnations of their vessels or other property have been made by the commissioners in London conformably to the seventh article of the treaty. The sums awarded by the commissioners have been paid by the British government. A considerable number of other claims were costs and damages and not captured property were the only objects in question, have been decided by arbitration, and the sums awarded to the citizens of the United States have also been paid. The commissioners appointed agreeably to the 21st article of our treaty with Spain 
met at Philadelphia in the summer past to examine and decide on the claims of our citizens for losses they have sustained, in consequence of their vessels and cargoes having been taken by the subjects of His Catholic Majesty during the late war between Spain and France. Their sittings have been interrupted, but are now resumed. The United States, being obligated to make compensation for the losses and damages sustained by British subjects upon the award of the commissioners acting under the sixth article of the Treaty with Great Britain, and for the losses and damages sustained by British subjects by reason of the capture of their vessels and merchandise taken within the limits and jurisdiction of the United States and brought into their ports, or taken by vessels originally armed in ports of the United States, Upon the awards of the commissioners acting under the seventh article of the same treaty, it is necessary that provision be made for fulfilling these obligations. The numerous captures of American vessels by the cruisers of the French Republic, and of some by those of Spain, have occasioned considerable expenses in making and supporting the claims of our citizens before their tribunals. The sums required for this purpose have, in diverse instances, been dispersed by the consuls of the United States. By means of the same captures, great numbers of our seamen have been thrown ashore in foreign countries, destitute of all means of subsistence, and the sick in particular have been exposed to grievous sufferings. The consuls have in these cases also advanced monies for their relief. For these advances, they reasonably expect reimbursements from the United States. The Consular Act relative to seamen requires revision and amendment. The provisions for their support in foreign countries and for their return are found to be inadequate and ineffectual. Another provision seems necessary to be added to the Consular Act. Some foreign vessels have been discovered sailing under the flag of the United States and with forged papers. It seldom happens that the consuls can detect this deception, because they have no authority to demand an inspection of the registers and sea letters. Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, it is my duty to recommend to your serious consideration those objects which by the Constitution are placed particularly within your sphere the national debts and taxes. Since the decay of the feudal system, by which the public defense was provided for chiefly at the expense of individuals, the system of loans has been introduced, and as no nation can raise within the year by taxes, sufficient sums for its defense and military operations in time of war, the sums loaned and debts contracted have necessarily become the subjects of what have been called funding systems. The consequences arising from the continual accumulation of public debts in other countries ought to admonish us to be careful to prevent their growth in our own. The national defense must be provided for, as well as the support of government. But both should be accomplished as much as possible by immediate taxes and as little as possible by loans. The estimates for the service of the ensuing year will by my direction be laid before you. Gentlemen of the Senate and gentlemen of the House of Representatives, we are met together at a most interesting period. The situations of the principal powers of Europe are singular and portentous. Connected with some by treaties and with all by commerce, no important event there can be indifferent to us. Such circumstances call, with peculiar importunity, not less for a disposition to unite in all those measures on which the honor, safety, and prosperity of our country depend, than for all the exertions of wisdom and firmness. In all such measures you may rely on my zealous and hearty concurrence. End of section 9. Section 10 of State of the Union Addresses, 1790-1816. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 10. State of the Union Address, John Adams, December 8, 1798. Gentlemen of the Senate and gentlemen of the House of Representatives, while with reverence and resignation 
we contemplate the dispensations of divine providence in the alarming and destructive pestilence with which several of our cities and towns have been visited, there is cause for gratitude and mutual congratulations that the malady has disappeared, and that we are again permitted to assemble in safety at the seat of government for the discharge of our important duties. But when we reflect that this fatal disorder has within a few years made repeated ravages in some of our principal seaports, and with increased malignancy, and when we consider the magnitude of the evils arising from the interruption of public and private business, whereby the national interests are deeply affected, I think it my duty to invite the legislature of the Union to examine the expediency of establishing suitable regulations in aid of the health laws of the respective states. For these being formed on the idea that contagious sickness may be communicated through the channels of commerce, there seems to be a necessity that Congress, who alone can regulate trade, should frame a system which, while it may tend to preserve the general health, may be compatible with the interests of commerce and the safety of the revenue. While we think on this calamity and sympathize with the immediate sufferers, we have abundant reason to present to the Supreme Being our annual oblations of gratitude for a liberal participation in the ordinary blessings of His providence. To the usual subjects of gratitude, I cannot omit to add one of the first importance to our well-being and safety, I mean the spirit which has arisen in our country against the menaces and aggression of a foreign nation a manly sense of national honor, dignity, and independence has appeared which, if encouraged and invigorated by every branch of government, will enable us to view, undismayed, the enterprises of any foreign power and become the sure foundation of national prosperity and glory. The course of the transactions in relation to the United States and France, which have come to my knowledge during your recess, will be made the subject of a future communication. That communication will confirm the ultimate failure of the measures which have been taken by the government of the United States toward an amicable adjustment of differences with that power. You will at the same time perceive that the French government appears solicitous to impress the opinion that it is averse to a rupture with this country, and that it has, in a qualified manner, declared itself willing to receive a minister from the United States for the purpose of restoring a good understanding. It is unfortunate for professions of this kind that they should be expressed in terms which may countenance the inadmissible pretension of a right to prescribe the qualifications which a minister from the United States should possess, and that while France is asserting the existence of a disposition on her part to conciliate with sincerity the differences which have arisen, the sincerity of a like disposition on the part of the United States, of which so many demonstrative proofs have been given, should even be indirectly questioned. It is also worthy of observation that the decree of the Directory, alleged to be intended to restrain the depredations of French cruisers on our commerce, has not given, and cannot give, any relief. It enjoins them to conform to all the laws of France relative to cruising and prizes, while these laws are themselves the sources of the depredations of which we have so long, so justly, and so fruitlessly complained. The law of France, enacted in January last, which subjects to capture and condemnation neutral vessels and their cargoes, if any portion of the latter are of British fabric or produce, Although the entire property belonged to neutrals, instead of being rescinded, has lately received a confirmation by the failure of a proposition for its repeal. While this law, which is an unequivocal act of war on the commerce of the nations it attacks, continues in force, those nations can see in the French government only a power, regardless of their essential rights of their independence and sovereignty, and if they possess the means, they can reconcile nothing with their interest and honor but a firm resistance. Hitherto, therefore, there is nothing discoverable in the conduct of France which ought to change or relax our measures of defense. On the contrary, 
to extend and invigorate them is our true policy. We have no reason to regret that these measures have been thus far adopted and pursued, and in proportion, as we enlarge our view of the portentous and incalculable situation of Europe, we shall discover new and cogent motives for the full development of our energies and resources. But in demonstrating by our conduct that we do not fear war, in the necessary protection of our rights and honor, we shall give no room to infer that we abandon the desire of peace. An efficient preparation for war can alone ensure peace. It is peace that we have uniformly and preservingly cultivated, and harmony between us and France may be restored at her option. But to send another minister without more determinate assurances that he would be received would be an act of humiliation to which the United States ought not to submit. It must therefore be left with France, if she is indeed desirous of accommodation, to take the requisite steps. The United States will steadily observe the maxims by which they have hitherto been governed. They will respect the sacred rights of embassy, and with a sincere disposition on the part of France to desist from hostility, to make reparation for the injuries heretofore inflicted on our commerce, and to do justice in future, there will be no obstacle to the restoration of a friendly intercourse. In making to you this declaration, I give a pledge to France and the world that the executive authority of this country still adheres to the humane and pacific policy which has invariably governed its proceedings, in conformity with the wishes of the other branches of the government and of the people of the United States. But considering the late manifestations of her policy toward foreign nations, I deem it a duty, deliberately and solemnly, to declare my opinion that whether we negotiate with her or not, vigorous preparations for war will be alike indispensable. These alone will give to us an equal treaty and ensure its observance. Among the measures of preparation which appear expedient, I take the liberty to recall your attention to the naval establishment. The beneficial effects of the small naval armament provided under the acts of the last session are known and acknowledged. Perhaps no country ever experienced more sudden and remarkable advantages from any measure of policy than we have derived from the arming of our maritime protection and defense. We ought, without loss of time, to lay the foundation for an increase of our navy to a size sufficient to guard our coast and protect our trade. Such a naval force, as it is doubtless in the power of the United States to create and maintain, would also afford to them the best means of general defense by facilitating the safe transportation of troops and stores to every part of our extensive coast. To accomplish this important object, a prudent foresight requires that systematic measures be adopted for procuring at all times the requisite timber and other supplies. In what manner this shall be done, I leave to your consideration. I will now advert, gentlemen, to some matters of less moment, but proper to be communicated to the National Legislature. After the Spanish garrisons have evacuated the posts they occupied at the Natchez and Walnut Hills, the Commissioner of the United States commences his observations to ascertain the point near the Mississippi, which terminated the northernmost part of the 31st degree of north latitude. From thence he proceeded to run the boundary line between the United States and Spain. He was afterwards joined by the Spanish Commissioner, when the work of the former was confirmed, and they proceeded together to the demarcation of this line. Recent information renders it probable that the southern Indians, either instigated to oppose the demarcation, or jealous of the consequences of suffering white people to run a line over lands to which the Indian title had not been extinguished, have ere this time stopped the progress of the commissioners. And considering the mischiefs which may result from continuing the demarcation, in opposition to the will of the Indian tribes, the great expense attending it, and that the boundaries which the commissioners have actually established probably extend at least as far as the Indian title has been extinguished, 
it will perhaps become expedient and necessary to suspend further proceedings by recalling our commissioner. The commissioners appointed in pursuance of the fifth article of the Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation between the United States and His Britannic Majesty to determine what river was truly intended under the name of the River St. Croix mentioned in the Treaty of Peace and forming a part of the boundary therein described have finally decided that question. On the 25th of October, they made their declaration that a river called Scudiac, which falls into Passamaquoddy Bay at its northwestern quarter, was the true St. Croix intended in the Treaty of Peace, as far as its great fork, where one of its streams come from the westward and the other from the northward, and that the latter stream is the continuation of the St. Croix to its source. This decision, it is understood, will preclude all contention among the individual claimants, as it seems that the Scudiac and its northern branch bound the grants of land which have been made by the respective adjoining governments. A subordinate question, however, it has been suggested, still remains to be determined. Between the mouth of the St. Croix, as now settled, and what is usually called the Bay of Fundy, lie a number of valuable islands. The commissioners have not continued the boundary line through any channel of these islands, and unless the Bay of Passamaquoddy be a part of the Bay of Fundy, this further adjustment of boundary will be necessary, but it is apprehended that this will not be a matter of any difficulty. Such progress has been made in the examination and decision of cases of captures and condemnations of American vessels, which were the subject of the seventh article of the Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation between the United States and Great Britain, that it is supposed the commissioners will be able to bring their business to a conclusion in August of the ensuing year. The commissioners acting under the 25th article of the Treaty between the United States and Spain have adjusted most of the claims of our citizens for losses sustained in consequence of their vessels and cargoes having been taken by the subjects of His Catholic Majesty during the late war between France and Spain. Various circumstances have concurred to delay the execution of the law for augmenting the military establishment, among these the desire of obtaining the fullest information to direct the best selection of officers. As this object will now be speedily accomplished, it is expected that the raising and organizing of the troops will proceed without obstacle and with effect. Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, I have directed an estimate of the appropriations which will be necessary for the service of the ensuing year to be laid before you, accompanied with a view of the public receipts and expenditures to a recent period. It will afford you satisfaction to infer the great extent and solidity of the public resources from the prosperous state of the finances, notwithstanding the unexampled embarrassments which have attended commerce. When you reflect on the conspicuous examples of patriotism and liberality which have been exhibited by our mercantile fellow citizens, and how a great proportion of the public resources depends upon their enterprise, you will naturally consider whether their convenience cannot be promoted and reconciled with the security of the revenue by a revision of the system by which the collection is at present regulated. During your recess, Measures have been steadily pursued for effecting the valuations and returns directed by the act of the last session, preliminary to the assessment and collection of a direct tax. No other delays or obstacles have been experienced, except such as were expected to arise from the great extent of our country and the magnitude and novelty of the operation, and enough has been accomplished to assure a fulfillment of the views of the legislature. Gentlemen of the Senate and gentlemen of the House of Representatives, I cannot close this address without once more adverting to our political situation and inculcating the essential importance of uniting in the maintenance of our dearest interests, and I trust that by the temper and wisdom of your proceedings, and by a harmony of measures, we shall secure to our country that weight and respect to which it is so justly entitled. End of section 10. Section 11 of State of the Union Addresses, 1790-1816. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 11. State of the Union Address, John Adams, December 2nd, 1799. Gentlemen of the Senate and Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, it is with peculiar satisfaction that I meet the Sixth Congress of the United States of America, coming from all parts of the Union at this critical and interesting period, the members must be fully possessed of the sentiments and wishes of our constituents. The flattering prospects of abundance, from the labors of the people by land and by sea, the prosperity of our extended commerce, notwithstanding interruptions occasioned by the belligerent state of a great part of the world, the return of health, industry, and trade to those cities which have lately been afflicted with disease, and the various and inestimable advantages, civil and religious, which secured under our happy frame of government, are continued to us unimpaired. Demand of the whole American people sincere thanks to a benevolent deity for the merciful dispensation of his providence. But while these numerous blessings are recollected, it is a painful duty to advert to the ungrateful return which has been made for them by some of the people in certain counties of Pennsylvania, where, seduced by the arts and misrepresentations of designing men, they have openly resisted the law directing the valuation of houses and lands. Such defiance was given to the civil authority as rendered hopeless all further attempts by judicial process to enforce the execution of the law, and it became necessary to direct a military force to be employed, consisting of some companies of regular troops, volunteers, and militia, by whose zeal and activity, in cooperation with the judicial power, order and submission were restored and many of the offenders arrested. Of these, some have been convicted of misdemeanors, and others charged with various crimes remain to be tried. To give due effect to the civil administration of government, and to ensure a just execution of the laws, a revision and amendment of the judiciary system is indispensably necessary. In this extensive country, it cannot but happen that numerous questions respecting the interpretation of the laws and the rights and duties of officers and citizens must arise. On the one hand, the laws should be executed. On the other, individuals should be guarded from oppression. Neither of these objects is sufficiently assured under the present organization of the judicial department. I therefore earnestly recommend the subject to your serious consideration. Persevering in the pacific and humane policy, which had been invariably professed and sincerely pursued by the executive authority of the United States, when indications were made on the part of the French Republic of a disposition to accommodate the existing differences between the two countries, I felt it to be my duty to prepare for meeting their advances by a nomination of ministers, upon certain conditions which the honor of our country dictated, and which its moderation had given it a right to prescribe. The assurances which were required of the French government, previous to the departure of our envoys, have been given through the Minister of Foreign Relations, and I have directed them to proceed on their mission to Paris. They have full power to conclude a treaty, subject to the constitutional advice and consent of the Senate. The characters of these gentlemen are sure pledges to their country, that nothing incompatible with its honor or interest, nothing inconsistent with our obligations of good faith or friendship to any other nation, will be stipulated. It appearing probable from the information I received that our commercial intercourse with some ports in the island of St. Domingo might safely be renewed, I took such steps as seemed to me expedient to ascertain that point. The result being satisfactory, I then, in conformity with the Act of Congress on the subject, directed the restraints and prohibitions of that intercourse to be discontinued, on terms which were made known by proclamation. Since the renewal of this intercourse, our citizens trading to those ports with their property have been duly respected, and privateering from those ports have ceased. 
in examining the claims of British subjects by the commissioners at Philadelphia, acting under the sixth article of the Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation with Great Britain, a difference of opinion on points deemed essential in the interpretation of that article has arisen between the commissioners appointed by the United States and the other members of that board, from which the former have thought it their duty to withdraw. It is sincerely to be regretted that the execution of an article produced by a mutual spirit of amity and justice should have been thus unavoidably interrupted. It is, however, confidently expected that the same spirit of amity and the same sense of justice in which it originated will lead to satisfactory explanations. In consequence of the obstacles to the progress of the commission in Philadelphia, His Britannic Majesty has directed the commissioners appointed by him under the seventh article of the treaty relating to the British captures of American vessels to withdraw from the board sitting in London, but with the express declaration of his determination to fulfill with punctuality and good faith the engagements which His Majesty has contracted by his treaty with the United States, and that they will be instructed to resume their functions whenever the obstacles which impede the progress of the commission at Philadelphia shall be removed. It being in like manner my sincere determination, so far as the same depends upon me, that with equal punctuality and good faith the engagements contracted by the United States in the treaties with His Britannic Majesty shall be fulfilled. I shall immediately instruct our minister at London to endeavor to obtain the explanation necessary to a just performance of those engagements on the part of the United States. With such dispositions on both sides, I cannot entertain a doubt that all difficulties will soon be removed and that the two boards will then proceed and bring the business committed to them respectively to a satisfactory conclusion. The Act of Congress relative to the seat of the Government of the United States, requiring that on the first Monday of December next it should be transferred from Philadelphia to the district chosen for its permanent seat, it is proper for me to inform you that the commissioners appointed to provide suitable buildings for the accommodation of Congress and of the President and of the public offices of the government have made a report of the state of the buildings designed for those purposes in the city of Washington, from which they conclude that the removal of the seat of government to that place at the time required will be practicable and the accommodation satisfactory. Their report will be laid before you. Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, I shall direct the estimates of the appropriations necessary for the service of the ensuing year, together with an account of the revenue and expenditure to be laid before you, during a period in which a great portion of the civilized world has been involved in a war unusually calamitous and destructive, it was not to be expected that the United States could be exempted from extraordinary burdens. Although the period is not arrived when the measures adopted to secure our country against foreign attacks can be renounced, yet it is alike necessary for the honor of the government and the satisfaction of the community that an exact economy should be maintained. I invite you gentlemen to investigate the different branches of the public expenditure, the examination will lead to beneficial retrenchments or produce a conviction of the wisdom of the measures to which the expenditure relates. Gentlemen of the Senate and Gentlemen of the House of Representatives, at a period like the present, when momentous changes are occurring and every hour is preparing new and great events in the political world, when a spirit of war is prevalent in almost every nation, with whose affairs the interests of the United States have any connection, unsafe and precarious would be our situation were we to neglect the means of maintaining our just rights. The result of the mission to France is uncertain, but however it may terminate, a steady perseverance in a system of national defense, commensurate with our resources and the situation of our country, is an obvious dictate of wisdom. For remotely as we are placed from the belligerent nations, and desirous as we are by doing justice to all to avoid offense to any, nothing short of the power of repelling aggressions will secure to our country a rational prospect of escaping the calamities of war or national degradation. 
as to myself it is my anxious desire so to execute the trust reposed in me as to render the people of the united states prosperous and happy i rely with entire confidence on your cooperation in objects equally your care and that our mutual labors will serve to increase and confirm union among our fellow citizens and an unshaken attachment to our government end of section eleven section twelve of state of the union addresses seventeen ninety to eighteen sixteen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b section twelve john adams november eleventh eighteen hundred state of the union address john adams november eleventh eighteen hundred gentlemen of the senate and gentlemen of the house of representatives immediately after the adjournment of congress at their last session in philadelphia i gave directions in compliance with the laws for the removal of the public offices records and property these directions have been executed and the public officers have since resided and conducted the ordinary business of the government in this place i congratulate the people of the united states on the assembling of congress at the permanent seat of their government and i congratulate you gentlemen on the prospect of a residence not to be changed although there is cause to apprehend that accommodations are not now so complete as might be wished yet there is great reason to believe that this inconvenience will cease with the present session it would be unbecoming the representatives of this nation to assemble for the first time in this solemn temple without looking up to the supreme ruler of the universe and imploring his blessing may this territory be the residence of virtue and happiness in this city may that piety and virtue that wisdom and magnanimity that constancy and self-government which adorn the great character whose name it bears be forever held in veneration here and throughout our country may simple manners pure morals and true religion flourish forever it is with you gentlemen to consider whether the local powers over the district of columbia vested by the constitution in the congress of the united states shall be immediately exercised if in your opinion this important trust ought now to be executed you cannot fail while performing it to take into view the future probable situation of the territory for the happiness of which you are about to provide you will consider it as the capital of a great nation advancing with unexampled rapidity in arts in commerce in wealth and in population and possessing within itself those energies and resources which if not thrown away or lamentably misdirected will secure to it a long course of prosperity and self-government in compliance with the law of the last session of congress the officers and soldiers of the temporary army have been discharged it affords real pleasure to recollect the honorable testimony they gave of the patriotic motives which brought them into the service of their country by the readiness and regularity with which they returned to the station of private citizens it is in every point of view of such primary importance to carry the laws into prompt and faithful execution and to render that part of the administration of justice which the constitution and laws devolve on the federal courts as convenient to the people as may consist with their present circumstances that i cannot omit once more to recommend to your serious consideration the judiciary system of the united states no subject is more interesting than this to the public happiness and to none can those improvements which may have been suggested by experience be more beneficially applied a treaty of amity and commerce with the king of prussia has been concluded and ratified the ratifications have been exchanged and i have directed the treaty to be promulgated by proclamation the difficulties which suspended the execution 
of the sixth article of our treaty of amity commerce and navigation with great britain have not yet been removed the negotiation on this subject is still depending as it must be for the interest and honor of both nations to adjust this difference with good faith i indulge confidently the expectation that the sincere endeavors of the government of the united states to bring it to an amicable termination will not be disappointed the envoys extraordinary and ministers plenipotentiary from the united states to france were received by the first consul with the respect due to their character and three persons with equal powers were appointed to treat with them although at the date of the last official intelligence the negotiation had not terminated yet it is to be hoped that our efforts to effect an accommodation will at length meet with a success proportioned to the sincerity with which they have been so often repeated while our best endeavors for the preservation of harmony with all nations will continue to be used the experience of the world and our own experience admonish us of the insecurity of trusting too confidently to their success we cannot without committing a dangerous imprudence abandon those measures of self-protection which are adapted to our situation and to which notwithstanding our pacific policy the violence and injustice of others may again compel us to resort while our vast extent of sea-coast the commercial and agriculture habits of our people the great capital they will continue to trust on the ocean suggests the system of defense which will be most beneficial to ourselves our distance from europe and our resources for maritime strength will enable us to employ it with effect seasonable and systematic arrangements so far as our resources will justify for a navy adapted to defensive war and which may in case of necessity be quickly brought into use seem to be as much recommended by a wise and true economy as by a just regard for our future tranquillity for the safety of our shores and for the protection of our property committed to the ocean the present navy of the united states called suddenly into existence by a great national exigency has raised us in our own esteem and by the protection afforded to our commerce has affected to the extent of our expectations the objects for which it was created in connection with a navy ought to be contemplated the fortification of some of our principal seaports and harbors a variety of considerations which will readily suggest themselves urge an attention to this measure of precaution to give security to our principal ports considerable sums have already been expended but the works remain incomplete it is for congress to determine whether additional appropriations shall be made in order to render competent to the intended purposes the fortifications which have been commenced the manufacture of arms within the united states still invites the attention of the national legislature at a considerable expense to the public this manufacture has been brought to such a state of maturity as with continued encouragement will supersede the necessity of future importations from foreign countries gentlemen of the house of representatives i shall direct the estimates of the appropriations necessary for the ensuing year together with an account of the public revenue and expenditure to a late period to be laid before you i observe with much satisfaction that the product of the revenue during the present year has been more considerable than during any former equal period this result affords conclusive evidence of the great resources of this country and of the wisdom and efficiency of the measures which have been adopted by congress for the protection of commerce and preservation of public credit gentlemen of the senate and gentlemen of the house of representatives as one of the grand community of nations our attention is irresistibly drawn to the important scenes which surround us if they have exhibited an uncommon portion of calamity it is the province of humanity to deplore and of wisdom to avoid the causes which may have produced it if turning our eyes homeward 
we find reason to rejoice at the prospect which presents itself if we perceive the interior of our country prosperous free and happy if all enjoy in safety under the protection of laws emanating only from the general will the fruits of their own labor we ought to fortify and cling to those institutions which have been the source of such real felicity and resist with unabating perseverance the progress of those dangerous innovations which may diminish their influence to your patriotism gentlemen has been confided the honorable duty of guarding the public interests and while the past is to your country a sure pledge that it will be faithfully discharged permit me to assure you that your labors to promote the general happiness will receive from me the most zealous cooperation. End of section 12